On this edition of Exposé, Miami's hot real estate market leaves some out in the cold. This is where my dream home would have been located. Now, I don't know what happened. An investigation that brings a city to its boiling point. We want housing now! It woke this town up like it hadn't been woken up in years. It was like a bomb going off. Funding for Exposé has been provided by Welcome to Miami, home to some of America's most colorful reporting. We work in the candy land of American journalism because you have every flavor of candy here, and your candy for us would be scams, corruption, crime, and just weird events that make us so great. Our columnist Carl Heisen says, do you want to be a car thief somewhere like Detroit, or do you want to be a car thief here? Not a knock on Detroit, but the point is, it don't snow here. And when you get hired here, it's in the DNA that you want to be the watchdog, find out what's being done wrong and what's being done illegal on your beat. In late 2005, the Miami Herald investigative team had its eye on an affordable housing crisis affecting the tens of thousands of workers who make this city run. Beyond all the glitz of South Beach, this is still the fourth poorest community in the country. It's a service economy, restaurants, hotels, and so forth. So we asked ourselves, where is the workforce living? It was a mystery. Though skyrocketing home prices and stagnant wages had intensified a housing shortage here, the Herald knew that county coffers were brimming with millions of local, state, and federal dollars set aside for public housing. So why were there so few places to live? I think when you have 40,000 people on a waiting list, there were tens of thousands more that wanted that housing, it's critically important to look and see why are we running short when there's all this money. It just doesn't make sense. My name is Hannah Newstrom. How can I help you? I did not want to take this on. I had just come off of a national investigation on the National Weather Service that got, you know, a lot of attention um, internationally. And I did not want to go back to writing about county government. You know, that's kind of like what you do in your 20s. And they basically said, go, come back in a couple weeks, let us know what you find. The more investigative reporter Debbie Senzipper thought about it, the more she was intrigued. On her daily commute to work, she drove past empty lots in low-income neighborhoods, dotted with signs claiming affordable homes were on the way. Beginning her research, she headed straight to the government agency charged with subsidizing housing for low-income families, the Miami-Dade Housing Agency, one of the largest in the country. One of its key functions is to loan money to private developers to help them build affordable homes for the poor. The way it's meant to work is that the developer secures land and financing, including the housing agency loan. But the developer doesn't draw on the loan until ground is broken. So he says, let's look at all the loans, who got the loans, and what did they build? I wanted to look at new construction because I wanted to see what was coming out of the ground. And so very early on, I developed my universe. I'm going to look at it for the last five years. How much money's going out, who's getting it, what's being built, and if nothing's being built, why not? And I was able to reach key administrators at the housing agency and get them to talk to me candidly before they realized what I was doing. Senzipper heard disturbing stories. Checks going out in advance of construction against county policy. The agency dipping into tax revenue not to build homes as mandated, but to cover its budget shortfalls. The agency soon limited the reporter's access to its staff. 
Once the government here realized what I was doing, nobody was allowed to talk to me anymore. But she knew they couldn't keep her from their records. She began filing freedom of information requests. Where are they today? When Debbie didn't dead, get her open records requests alive, met, I was immediately emailing the, the public information officers of the county housing agency, reminding them of public records law 119, the state of Florida, which requires these records to be released. The housing agency complied, but its records were inconsistent, incomplete, and nearly incomprehensible to ZenZipper. I sat at the housing agency like, you know, for, for, for weeks going through stacks and stacks of folders on every project. And there was no project tracking database. They would hand me reports and projects would be on one report and then they'd fall off another report and then they'd give me another report and there'd be a whole new set of projects. One thing SinZipper was trying to determine was what had happened to a certain nest egg, which supplements the agency's affordable housing budget. In 1983, Miami took advantage of a building boom by adding a surtax on commercial property sales. The money would be used to build or rehabilitate public housing. In its first two decades, the tax produced $275 million. SinZipper figured if she followed that money, she'd get to the truth. But with county records in a shambles, the only way to do it was to build a database herself. So I ended up starting from scratch and rebuilding what had happened by looking at original contracts, original mortgages, promissory notes, and things like that. Debbie has a great ability to be able to find gaps and holes in budgets, forensic accounting to some extent, if you will, where you're able to actually see money allocated, and then you're able to f see who received the money Debbie came back after a couple of weeks, and it was real simple, brick and mortar, brick and mortar. You got money, show me the house. Crunching the agency's own numbers, SenZipper learned that from 2003 to 2005, it had pledged over $87 million to 72 developments, more than 8,300 homes. But, she found, about 40% of the projects had been canceled, others delayed for months or even years. I could tell even from the sloppy, inconsistent reports on paper that I got from the housing agency that money was going out and nothing was being built. The reporter had the numbers. Her next step was to learn what she could from those who'd been waiting years for promised housing. It was so inspiring to meet families. In a city where you see these luxury high-rises going up and there is so much money here. and to see families who work so hard. I mean, working poor families, cafeteria cooks and nursing aides and construction workers living like this, it just, it drove, drove it home. Among the people SenZipper met was 54-year-old Ozzy Porter, a public housing resident for 17 years. She had long wanted a home to call her own. I'm waiting on my home to be built. I have been waiting for three years now for my homes to be built and it's never, it never have been built. A school cafeteria cook earning $10 an hour, Porter had saved for four years to be able to put down a $5,000 deposit. Ozzy had waited years for this house and looked at the lot and planned what the house would look like and where the shade would be and where the sun would be and you know, where her kitchen would be. and actually kept a picture laminated in her front room. This is where my dream home was, would have been located. In this big, beautiful lot. <laughs> now, I don't know what happened. Years later, the lot lay vacant, but Ozzy Porter remained hopeful. I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up. Still, I'm gonna have my dream home, I'm gonna have it. SenZipper heard story after story like Ozzy Porter's. There was Alfreda Martin, a teacher's aide who waited three years for a house that was never built. And Marta Bido and her daughter, who both have muscular dystrophy, also waiting three years for promised housing. And Shamika Carter, a hairdresser who could barely afford a $600 a month apartment with crumbling ceilings and walls. Debbie came back from doing interviews in the field. And she says, I just got back from a home where a mother 
was living in a rat-infested house. She had four children sleeping on a mattress. And she has the money to pay for affordable housing. They don't have the units for her. She's been on a waiting list, waiting. These were not deadbeats. These were working poor. And that's what really got her. Now Senzipper had anecdotes to complement the statistics. But was it anything more than just a tale of inefficiency and waste? The hardest part is, you know, was there some, something corrupt going on? To answer that question, Senzipper had to figure out exactly who was getting money from the housing agency and what they were doing with it. But identifying the developers wasn't going to be easy. Debbie would invariably have to go to four to five different sources of information. Nobody came out here and held up a piece of paper and said, you see, this developer hasn't paid us back. In real estate, you know, developers will often create limited liability um, companies to protect other assets or themselves. And so the housing agency would list the name of an LLC, but I had no idea who the developer was. She found that one of the development companies, Riverside Homes of South Florida, belonged to a man named Oscar Rivero. Rivera was the son of a bus driver. He studied law at a local university and started cultivating connections to the political elite of Miami. Now he wanted to try his hand in real estate. In violation of its own policy against releasing money ahead of construction, the Miami-Dade Housing Agency advanced Rivero loans totaling nearly $1.6 million between 2002 and 2004 to build 78 affordable homes. Yet the paper trail revealed by 2006, Rivero's project still hadn't broken ground. Senzipper took expose to visit one of Rivero's sites in the spring of 2007. He promised to build townhouses. In fact, I bet anything that's the sign. We should get out and see. Yeah, this is it. Look at this. I can't believe this sign is still here. Riverside Homes, Miami-Dade Housing Funded Project. Never got done. I have a whole list of his defaults. If Rivera so, wasn't building affordable homes, what was he doing? Reporter Larry Lebowitz helped trace his moves. Their bottom line was 800 and some thousand, 816. Larry, he can really dig through records, property records. The OT15 or 26s didn't have, end up in the deal. There's so many deals on so much paper and so many loan numbers. We were able to piece together this man's assets. We realized that he was building basically a mansion for himself. A billiard room and a library and an elevator and columns and a pool and a spa and fountains and had never built anything with the public's money. It always amazes me what people will try to get away with. And the more I do this kind of work, the more I just want to just take them down. Because especially when the victims here are, you know, these mothers that I met, and you see how they're living, and then you see Oscar Rivero building himself a mansion. I mean, my God, how do you live with yourself? Senzipper's investigation took her from one failed project to another. But the biggest debacle was yet to come. The Miami-Dade Housing Agency had a plan to revitalize the troubled Scott and Carver housing projects. It was very run down, problems with drugs, crime, everything you would expect. But it was also a very historic neighborhood. Generations had grown up there. With a $35 million grant in hand from the federal government, in 2000, the housing agency planned to replace the old barrack-style residences with 411 new houses. It called the new project Hope Six, and rather than give it to a developer, decided to handle it in-house. Six years later, when I drove out there, it was what we, we termed a, a wasteland. No construction. It was absolute devastation. 
There you go. And this is 354 townhouses and single family homes, phase two. In all, SendZipper calculated that the housing agency spent nearly $22 million to get the Hope 6 project going. What we found is that a lot of the money went for administrative fees, overhead, consultants who double billed the housing agency. With the raising or boarding up of their homes, more than 800 families were thrown into the already crowded housing market. Families basically got scattered all over the county. We don't know where many of them are right now. Um, some people believe there are now, a lot of them are now homeless with children. Local housing advocates were incensed. We went to the county commission to say, how can you lose these families? This is your job. You were paid by the federal government not only to move them, but to maintain records on them for the next five to ten years. Sushma Sheth is the communications director of the Miami Workers Center, which advocates for affordable housing. She put Senzipper in touch with some of the displaced people of Hope 6. I love to stay in there. And uh, it was, I had two kids at home. They were still in school. And then when all this came along, we, you know, it's like upset the family. You got to change the children's school. They say it was a bad community, but to the kids around there, you can tell it was a bad community. They took the soul out of these people's heart. Right. They took all of what they believed in, all of what they can live and fight for out of them. It was a colossal failure by the housing agency. But how, Senzipper wondered, could it have occurred? Rene Rodriguez, the agency's head from 1996 to 2004, had a solid reputation. Rene Rodriguez was considered a huge success, a huge success. He was quoted nationally, he has testified before Congress, he was considered a real leader nationally in, in public housing. But a closer look at Rodriguez and the small world of developers surrounding him told Senzipper a different story. I did extensive background searches on 300 people, personal and professional and political affiliations, campaign contributions, and what businesses they've started going back years and who their business partners were. And that was tedious, eye-glazing, exhausting. Senzipper found an insider's club where backs were scratched and palms were greased, with some developers getting hundreds of thousands of dollars without signed loan documents or the mandatory builder's insurance necessary to protect taxpayers from liability. Then there were the no-bid contracts given to the MDHA Development Corporation, set up by the county as a nonprofit developer. It, too, was headed by Rene Rodriguez. Senzipper found that over five years, it had received $16 million from the county, as well as dozens of vacant lots to build on. It had promised to build 17 affordable housing projects. It had produced just one, an assisted living center. This was its swimming pool. In 2004, Rene Rodriguez left the Miami-Dade Housing Agency and the MDHA Development Corp. He became a consultant over the next two years, as the Herald would later report, Rodriguez was paid tens of thousands of dollars by at least seven of the developers who had received loans from the housing agency when he was its director. One of them was his golfing buddy, Oscar Rivero, the developer who had received nearly $1.6 million in loans without building a single home. Senzipper discovered that Rivero hadn't paid back the construction loans from the housing agency, but he did pay Rodriguez $50,000. Senzipper reported that Rodriguez ignored all of her interview requests. You had a director of the Miami-Dade Housing Agency who was in bed with developers. He clearly had deep connections with them. He favored them. He allowed several who had virtually no billing experience to get millions of dollars and then never bothered to collect the money. Nor did he, did he himself hold them accountable. It's a perfect storm of, of corruption and neglect. I think if this was, you know, the I don't know, some other fund of money, you know, to, to build a sports stadium, there would be some, there would be some more scrutiny. Instead, this is affordable housing money, um, and this is not the sexy or priority issue of the community. 
after a seven month investigation send zipper was armed with the facts and faces to tell a story the miami herald called house of lies i had it after this even though its failures in many ways eclipsed the counties and compound a housing crisis. We also don't have a photo of like decrepit housing and that's what she would show for us. And the one thing you tell yourself as an investigative reporter is they can't undo what's already been done. The series premiered July 23, 2006. It was like a bomb going off. Are you going to open up the vacant units? Are you going to fill all the vacant units? Are you going to rehabilitate every unit? We want housing now! Housing now! Housing it was very much the kind of project that resonated right away, that hit people right away. Where's the housing? Where's the housing? It woke this town up like it's never, it hadn't been woken up in, in years. Within three days, two county housing officials were fired. Two others put on administrative leave. I had hundreds and hundreds of calls. People wanted justice, they wanted accountability. The state attorney's office was bombarded with phone calls. Responding to the outcry, on August 20, the Miami Herald held a town meeting bringing the public together with government officials, including the state attorney, Catherine Fernandez Rundle. You are going to see people be locked up. Less than a week later, developer Oscar Rivero was arrested and led away in handcuffs. Send Zipper, to use her term, had taken him down. The impact of House of Lies was felt for months. The Miami Herald continued rolling out stories of arrests, cleanups, emergency legislation, and a criminal investigation of former housing agency head Renee Rodriguez. A year after she started her investigation, Send Zipper's story still reverberated. She took expose to see what has happened to the Hope 6 project. She found the charitable organization Habitat for Humanity hard at work building houses, using its own funds at no cost to the county. After the series ran, Habitat for Humanity, the only builder that's been building out here, um, stepped up. And now you have a neighborhood. You have a whole neighborhood starting. I mean, it's, it's amazing what they've done out here. I mean, my God, now you see, now you see life. But it's just the beginning. Then there was the cafeteria cook who had saved for years for a home that never materialized. With assistance from a slew of business, government, and foundation interests, Ozzy Porter finally got a home to match her dream. I felt good. I didn't care if I had to sign a million papers. I felt good signing. I did. I felt good. I felt good signing. And it was a whole big party. Hello. How are you? How are you doing? I'm so pleased to see you. I'm so glad you you would have us here. I wanted to see your house. Come on in. Come on, kitchen. All granite tops. <laughs> South Florida being South Florida, in almost in every generation, you've always had corruption here, like any major metropolis. And my view is, where you have human beings, you're going to have corruption. It's just in our nature to be greedy. Some folks are more creative in their greediness. But you'd figure at some point the politicians or these government officials or developers would have learned, you know, I don't want to walk out of here in handcuffs and have my kids see me on TV. But it's this denial, yeah, I can get away with it. I can get away with it. And then what I feel happy about is the Miami Herald helps expose them and then they get in handcuffs.
funding for expose has been provided by